my name's Graham Crow, and I'm going to be doing this next presentation on what are um, community studies. And John has very kindly agreed to time me, so if I'm looking so I'm going to run over, uh, then he'll, uh, he'll wave frantically, and, and, and that will allow time for um, questions. I'm also happy if, if, as I'm going through, you have any uh, questions or comments, points of clarification, uh, by all means, do, uh, do, do, do stop me. Um, but I'm also conscious that this is the slot before lunch, so I will definitely stop by 12.45. Okay. So I'm going to be talk, talking to the uh, what is titled what are, because, of course, community studies are, are plural. So talking to the title, um, what are community studies? And this is the outline of what I want to go through, just to say a little bit about the community studies tradition of research, um, say something about definitions, definitional challenges, um, identify some methodological issues in the community studies tradition of research and then discuss some exemplars in the what is format. It's, it's often useful to give concrete examples of, of the kinds of issues that are being raised, say a little bit about the evolution of um, community studies and uh, then some conclusions. The point about the evolution and I guess there'll be some uh, points here about the history of this tradition. National Centre for Research Methods is uh, committed to methodological innovation and, and pushing things forward at the cutting edge. So it may seem a little odd to have a, a, a presentation in which I'm going to be talking about some research approaches that have been around for a very long while. But um, things that have been around for a long while don't stay the same. They evolve, they, uh, there are innovations and so on. And one of the things I'm particularly interested in in this area is how the whole approach has shifted and evolved and innovations have been adopted. So. Uh, although there have been community studies in uh, various parts of the world for the, for the best part of the last hundred years, um, they, they're not, what, how community studies are practiced now wouldn't really be uh, directly recognisable by the people who were doing them the uh, best part of a hundred years ago. So I'm interested in that kind of evolutionary uh, process within research traditions. Okay, so this tradition, as I say, is, is long established. It's, it's, it's a recognised body of work and it's quite diverse. There's disagreement about exactly what should count as a community study, uh, and that's fine. But very broadly, um, it's pieces of research that have a focus on ordinary people's everyday lives. I like that expression. It's, it's an attempt to sort of capture what life is like in a uh, community context. So seeing life in the round, trying to get a sense of how the different parts of life, uh, ordinary life, fit together, um, ordinary everyday life, ordinary people. Okay, and uh, just some classic examples. So uh, I'll perhaps show my age here, but how many of you know of Michael Young and Peter Wilmot's Family and Kinship in East London? Okay, for those of you who don't, uh, which is most of you, um, that was the year I was born, so it's, it's got a special place in my heart. But uh, uh, Young and Wilmot's Family and Kinship in East London was um, a, a classic study uh, by, um, by, by two authors who were pioneering social researchers. And it had a huge impact, partly because it was on an important topic of housing change and, and, uh, and, and community change in, in East London and the uh, continuing importance of family within that. Um, it was published by Penguin and sold over half a million copies, which, for those of you who don't know, uh, any academic work that sells anything like that is pretty rare. <laughs> and um, Penguin books are one way in which in which academic uh, publications have over the years got out to a much wider public. So if we're thinking about uh, the issue of the impact of social research, then this would be an example of something that reached much wider than the academic community to uh, lay audiences and also policy audiences. So this is, a, this is an example of how a piece of research on an apparently mundane topic, family and kinship in East London, you might think that wouldn't be uh, particularly uh, interest to, to wider audiences, but it did have a big uh, influence on thinking about urban redevelopment and also on uh, policy in relation to uh, welfare around families and so on. That's just one, uh, one, one example in this tradition of community studies, which is particularly well known uh, in the field. And I'll come back to that because it was re-studied. And I want to say something about re-studies, just to tie in with what Jane was saying earlier about research that revisits populations uh, over time. Now, if we try to trace the start of this tradition, people often go back to a classic study that was conducted 
in a place called Muncie, Indiana. Um, at the time, it was given the pseudonym Middletown. And Robert and Helen Lind, a, a husband and wife team of researchers, uh, had the brief of studying, initially their, their, their brief was to study religion in the context of an ordinary small town American uh, community. Um, but as they conducted the research, it grew and they, uh, they, they looked at a whole range of things that they said captured the nature of ordinary people's everyday lives. So there were six main chapters to the middle town uh, study and also subsequent uh, re-study uh, around getting a living, so uh, the nature of work, making a home, training the young, uh, education, uh, using leisure, engaging in religious practices, so religion stayed there as one of, the, one of these six things, uh, and engaging in community practices, that includes community politics and third sector activity and so on. And they revisited this community um, uh, some years later, and the book came out uh, in, in 1937. And uh, that's interesting for a number of reasons. So they set up this idea that you can learn things about social change by going back to where a uh, community has, has been studied previously. Um, but it also flags up some of the uh, immediate problems that are confronted because in the original study, there was no mention of the um, family, the, the Ball family, they're called the X family in the study, but everybody knows it's the Ball family. Um, who were the large local employers, and in the re-study uh, they got quite a bit more coverage. Now the question is, did they become more prominent in the time between the first study and the re-study, or was it something about the way in which um, the researchers had changed their interests? Uh, it is reported that Robert Lind had read Karl Marx in between uh, the first and second study, so maybe he was looking for you know, a capitalist figure, um, I don't know if any of you were at the session yesterday of the uh, socialist magician, but um, that might have led, led, led him in that direction anyway, this kind of interest in the nature of class and class conflict and so on. And that, that is something that I'll come back to, just this challenge of if you've got a re-study of a community and uh, the account is different from the in initial one, is that an indication of social change or is that an indication of perhaps change, uh, change on the part of the researchers in the methods that they use and the theories that they're employing. But reference within the community studies tradition refers back to, um, to, uh, to, to the classic Middletown study, and I'll come back to a more recent study uh, in a minute. There's lots and lots of literature. As you can see from the dates here, this confirms that this is a, a well-established old tradition of, of research. Um, but it is one from some of the more recent references here, you can see that, that, that continues. It's, it's not been a tradition of research that's been equally popular and equally um, contributed to over the years. There have been sort of higher points of interest and activity and, and lower points. But any of you interested in this issue about how a tradition of research changes over time might look, like to look at some of these studies. So as with all areas, we have to define our terms. What do we mean by community? Well, community is probably one of the most contested and, and difficult concepts to uh, come up with a satisfactory uh, definition. Um, a researcher in the 1950s tried to do that and, and, and concluded that they were getting on for 100 different definitions of community and the only thing that they had in common was that they, they all involved people. So that didn't take things further forward, except to recognise that when we look at definitions of community, we're unlikely to get a consensus. We're unlikely to get everybody saying, that's, it, that's exactly the definition of community that I want to work with. Um, and just because it's popular doesn't mean to say that we have a, a clearer meaning as Peter Wilmot, that's the same Peter Wilmot, uh, said in, in that 1989 piece. But if, it, if we say, well, it's about people having something in common, well, what is that thing? Is it a shared territory? Is it a geographical community? Or is it a shared interest? Is it, is it uh, perhaps people who've got a common kind of class position? Uh, or is it some community of attachment, some, some attachment to, to a symbol or a, uh, an ideal? Or is it some combination of these? And over the years, there have been classic studies done on um, communities that draw on elements of all these. So in, in the United Kingdom, for example, mining communities have been studied because they are often densely concentrated in particular locations. Some mining communities in the, uh, in the middle part of the last century had uh, over 90% of, of their, their populations in, in villages 
uh, being involved or being in, in households that were employed in the, in the mining industry. So they were geographically concentrated, they had a common interest in a particular uh, occupational community and that they, they also had a very strong cultural uh, point of connection. So mining communities are often seen as sort of like the ideal type of where you get all these different things in common coming together very strongly. Um, we've got the further difficulty though that, that community when it's used is, is often used evaluatively, it seems to kind of convey a warm glow, community is a good thing, who here isn't in favour of community, no one's putting their hands up and that's because uh, it's got this sort of sense of, of attraction uh, about it and Raymond Plant, um, who was the master of this college for a while, uh, has written about how community is a valued and valuable achievement. So there are all sorts of difficulties in, in, in the use of the term and some people um, prefer not to use the term community and, and there have been discussions about whether locality or some other uh, concept might do the job better because it's less evaluative. But in general community studies are research projects that uh, seek to capture and portray ordinary people's everyday lives and showing how these various parts the different elements that I talked about in the Lynn study, how, how the various things fit together. So how work sits alongside family, how, how those sit alongside education and uh, politics and, and religion and so on. Now, community studies in the tradition aren't all romantic accounts. There can be community studies, there have been community studies, which have uh, shown community to be a place of conflict. And one classic study of that took place in Sparkbrook in Birmingham in the 1960s in and around the theme of conflict over housing uh, and, and the uh, dimension of the connections of that to uh, uh, race and, and ethnicity, uh, especially around things like the allocation of social housing and also access to, uh, to, to private housing as well. And Ken Dempsey, one of my favourite studies, is a, of a community in Victoria given the pseudonym Small Town. I think one of the few communities to actually maintain the uh, anonymity given to it by, by the pseudonym. And Ken Dempsey writes there about how when he went and di did his research, so many people would say to him, oh, living in a small town, it's like being part of a big, ha you know, one big happy family. And he, uh, as, he, as his research progressed, came to question that narrative because he was aware that although the, this was the rhetoric of community as a, as a bringing together of people, was aware that there were also people at the margins, people who were living in, in sort of uh, substandard housing, people who were socially and, and physically marginalised. So we need to be beware of being taken in by community rhetoric. Um, and there is also the idea that community has the potential to be greater than some of the individual parts and, and although it has that potential it doesn't always happen. Sometimes the different bits of community pull in different directions and actually they achieve less than they have the potential to, uh, to do. So understanding community requires looking at a number of different dimensions, economy, uh, home life, education, leisure, religion, politics and how they fit together. Now that's a big task and the scale of it can be off-putting. Uh, Janet Foster did a study of Docklands, London Docklands, and that took her as a lone researcher some 10 years. Um, and Suzanne Keller has been studying a community near to her university in, uh, in New Jersey in the United States, and she's been doing that for over 30 years. So trying to, to cover everything and show how they fit together, you can't do that in, in five minutes. There's a further challenge about access and Ronald Frankenberg, who's one of the sort of classic pioneers of, of anthropological community research in the UK, um, uh, undertook a study in um, rural Wales in the 1950s and he was very definitely an outsider. He had a Jewish background, he'd come from Manchester. Um, people were understandably suspicious of this, of this person and his purpose. Why, why was he coming to study them? And in, in his account of this, he says he was on the outside and used to sort of in despair go up into the hills, look down and think, what is going on in there? Uh, fortunately, he had the idea that he would get involved with a local activity, football, and uh, as soon as he was prepared to get involved in one of the local um, uh, social uh, sporting activities, he moved from being an outsider to an insider. But it's a familiar challenge in community research and in other areas of research too, particularly in community, of how can, com how can outsiders get into communities to, to, to research them. Even if we've got access, there are further um, aspects of community that may continue to be hidden. Jeff Payne has written a lovely short piece uh, in which he asks the question, when I read community studies, they seem to be really full of nice people. So 
you know, what's going on here? Is it, am I missing something? Because in my experience, communities have got some nice people, but some people I don't get on with very much at all, and some people I would, you know, uh, avoid at all costs. And there is something there about sampling, that if you're doing an ethnography, if you're going in and talking to people, it is tempting, we're all human as researchers, it is tempting to gravitate to the people with whom we have some points of positive connection and to avoid the people who are going to give us a hard time. But that can then lead to what we might think of as a, as a sort of skewed uh, sample. Information may be more readily available from some community members than others. There are always um, power differentials within communities. So we need to think carefully about the types of data that we uh, collect. And if, as researchers, we uh, do a piece of research like that in Birmingham around uh, race and housing in, in the 1960s, and we write this up and give us a full and frank account of how uh, challenging circumstances are, that won't necessarily make you popular as a researcher. Even if uh, community members uh, privately agree, they won't necessarily want you telling the world about their dirty washing, about the problems in their community. So um, uh, we can find that community researchers uh, face the challenge of um, going in, doing research, writing up, broadcasting it, putting it out into a wider, uh, wider audience, and then finding that they are, um, that they are not appreciated. Uh, in, in, in one famous case, um, uh, a research team of Arthur Vidich and Joe Benzman went into a community in, in upstate New York, wrote their report on this, on this community, um, and then shortly afterwards uh, heard that they had been hanged in effigy in the town carnival uh, because they were so unpopular. Um, uh, because what they'd done is they'd gone in and they'd said, we're interested in community and you seem to have a really good community here. Can we talk to you about it? Can we collect information? And then we want to write about that um, because that might help other people. So I think they were sort of the authors of their own misfortune <laughs> in a way. Um, but when they then wrote the book, they wrote about a town that was divided, that had all sorts, all sorts of social hierarchies and conflict. And, and uh, the townspeople were understandably quite upset that they were being represented as, as sort of rather parochial, shall we say, uh, in, the, in, the, in their study. And other researchers have also had a negative, um, a negative response following publications of their accounts of community because that didn't chime with local uh, community members' understandings. Um, there are also criticisms of how do you describe community. Uh, C. Wright Mills once rather, he, he had quite a sharp tongue, and uh, he once said that the, the endless community studies, and actually we'd be much better off reading novels. The, these aren't even very good as novels, so don't bother with them. So there have been periods when community studies have gone out of fashion because of that uh, criticism. Um, and of course, you know, there, there is some subs substance to that, to that element, to that argument. Uh, just because something exists doesn't mean to, and hasn't been researched, doesn't mean to say that it's a good idea to research it. That's not unique to community research, but it is true there. So when people said, I found a community that hasn't yet been researched, you know, people are bound to be interested in this. The answer is, well, possibly, but possibly not. You know, it may come up with findings that actually we know very much about through um, other communities similar to that being studied. Sorry, I've gone uh, too far there. Um, talk about some exemplars. So, Ulwin Rees, in a classic study uh, in North Wales, um, he's got this lovely expression that the, the kinship network in, so he, uh, in an early, we heard yesterday, yesterday about uh, social network analysis, and this was an early, uh, early ex ex exploration of social network analysis and when he was looking at kinship what he uh, what he found was that the local expression was that people are connected in this in this community they're woven together like a pig's entrails and I'll show you what that looks like in his kinship diagram in the next slide and what he's trying to convey there is that there are there are so many dense interconnections between people and that does mean that you need to be careful if when you're conducting community research and people say what are you finding out if you say, well, I went and spoke to so-and-so up the hill and they told me something very interesting, um, and then you find that actually they're cousins or whatever. So be careful about what you disclose about your findings um, in, in, the, in that context. So here is the pig's entrails. This is the, uh, this is the parish boundary, and these links are kinship networks between members of different households and so on. And uh, um, to, if you sort of squint and, and, and use your imagination a bit, you might imagine that to be like a pig's entrails. Maybe none of you knows what a 
pig's entrails looks like. <laughs> my Saturday job when I was at school was as a butcher's rounds boy, so I do know what a pig's entrails looks like. And they are all kind of all messily interconnected uh, like that. I'm now vegetarian, by the way. <laughs> the second exemplar is one by Ray Powell, and this again conveys the point that doing a community study, trying to capture all these different dimensions, is hugely uh, complicated and am ambitious. This was something that didn't try to cover every aspect, but was interested in the nature of work broadly understood in a piece of research um, in a location uh, uh, called the Isle of Sheppey, which is in the Thames Estuary on the North Kent coast. And uh, here I'm making this point that this is an interesting example because of the range of methods that are used in this, in this study. So Ray Powell, um, who died last year, uh, when he was writing up his account of this, says, well, this is ethnography, it's historical demography, there's a quantitative survey, but if you look at the book, and I recommend it, it's a, it's a, it's a classic piece of community research, um, that this historical documentary research charts the way in which an occupational community built up around the, around the dockyards. The survey was a one in nine household survey um, on, on households and their work practices, but there was also a survey on employers and their attitudes towards the employment of local people because this was an area of particularly high uh, unemployment, particularly high youth unemployment. And the employers were quite frank about what they thought about local uh, school leavers in terms of their employability. And Ray Powell wrote that up and then got the flack himself, even though he was just the messenger rather than <laughs> the author of the, of the opinions. Um, there were interviews, including oral histories. Uh, there were all sorts of ethnographic observations. And also the book included some visual materials. And here's just one photograph from uh, from the book, which um, the, the, uh, it's probably too small for you to see, but it's talking about the apprenticeship system and the way in which, uh, in this, in this uh, community, the traditional trajectory for young men was to get an apprenticeship in a mechanical uh, or other skilled trade. And in the context of the collapse of that apprenticeship system, uh, this photograph is used to kind of capture the idea that um, apprenticeship is carrying on in some other, some other form. Um, those of you who might know Sheppey will kind of recognise that this is a fairly typical uh, uh, street. Not, not the motorbike being disassembled, but the housing and the, and the, and the layout is fairly typical of, of, that, uh, of that community still. Uh, other exemplars, I need to rush on a bit, but I'm just mentioning here Karen O'Reilly, who has conducted some very interesting ethnography around a mobile population. So going back to that point about our communities people with fixed attachment to places or something else in common. And what she did was to look at British people who uh, migrate to the Costa del Sol in Spain and set up new community uh, contexts there. And, and again, interested in that sort of insider-outsider uh, distinction, which is very common to community, uh, community arguments. Another exemplar is uh, Eric Lasseter and his colleagues who went back to Middletown. He was working in the, in the university, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana at the time, and picked up on how, although this community had been much studied since the original uh, piece of research by the Linz in the 1920s, there's virtually no reference in any of those studies or re-studies of the fact that the town has a substantial uh, African-American population. And there's an interesting history as to how the African-American population got written out of those previous pieces of research. But working um, with a collaborative approach and also working using uh, this as part of the curriculum, his students uh, spent a year collecting material and then um, <coughs> writing up about the other side of Middletown being the group that has previously been, uh, been, been silent in, in pieces of research on, the, on, on Muncie, but also it is physically the other side of the tracks in, in classic American uh, town planning style. And um, the other side of Middletown, I think, is, is an interesting exemplar for a number of reasons, thank you. Um, uh, one of which is that, that it captures this point I was making earlier about the evolution of methods and the movement towards much more collaborative style, so working with community members rather than doing research on communities. Um, and I also mention it because it uses a range of methods. There's visual methods. I shall show you some of the photographs that are, uh, that, that are from the front cover of the book on the next slide. The other thing to note is that although it's very ambitious, it covers all those aspects of the original study, um, it doesn't have to take a long time. 
community research can be done very quickly. So with a team of some uh, 70 people, including the students as researchers and himself and some colleagues and the community partners, uh, there were about 70 of them, and they collected the data in 2003, and the book was published in 2004. Uh, so, um, and it's a, wonderful, um, it's a wonderful study, I'd recommend it. Uh, here's the front cover. Um, the top photograph was interesting because they did run past the, uh, the community partners as to whether they should or shouldn't include particular photographs. There was quite a bit of controversy about the top photograph. Some of you may be able to see that it's a, um, an African-American young man and a white blonde young woman kissing on either side of a, a fence. But uh, although that's a great photograph, I think this one at the bottom is even better. And, uh, and I've often asked audiences, what do you think the, the, the uh, girl on the left has just said to the girl on the right to evoke that, that response? Any ideas? Something about the quarterback. Pardon? Something about the quarterback in his <laughs> Quite possibly. I did actually do this presentation in Muncie at Ball State University a couple of months ago. And, um, and uh, the, the answer from the audience there was, uh, she's saying, I hear that Ball State are going to give their faculty a raise this year. <laughs> so uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was the answer I got there. Anyway, um, so community studies have evolved as a tradition. And uh, some examples here of how visual methods are increasingly used in trying to capture the nature of ordinary people's everyday lives. Re-studies um, throw up all sorts of challenges because to go to, go to a, a community and re-study it, do we use the same methods or do we use newly available methods? Do we have the same problems or are we looking at different kind of uh, agendas? And there are lots of interesting cases that I just mentioned here, like Nikki Charles and her colleagues returned to Swansea to look at um, families in transition some 40 years on from the original study uh, conducted by um, Chris Harris and Colin Rosser, and the New East End is a, is a return study, a re-study of a type by Jeff Dench and his colleagues of the original Young and Wilmot uh, study in East London. And things change. So, for example, the, the, the political boundaries in the East End of London change, and what was the borough of Bethnal Green became, uh, uh, became Tower Hamlets. Um, and there's all sorts of issues that come up when findings are compared where you've got the same members of the team going back or you've got different people going back. So it raises all those questions about is this a difference because of social change or because of the method or because of something about the researchers and the way they're employing them. So I'm suggesting by conclusion that community studies are a distinctive tradition of research, that they've evolved and continue to evolve due to methodological and theoretical developments. We've become interested in different issues as well as, as, as having new um, skills available to us. Yesterday in the What Is presentation by John Scott, he was talking about social network analysis and that's something that's really added robustness to the way in which community gets um, researched. I think it also touches on all sorts of interesting issues about interdisciplinarity because community research is where geographers and anthropologists and sociologists and political scientists and, and policy researchers and others um, come together. It raises those very challenging issues about the status of case studies because these can be very detailed uh, pieces of research on one particular population. How do we then, can we then generalize and say, well, this has been happening in this community, so that's typical of the country as a whole, and that was a big issue about the Middletown study, which was designed to be, in some ways, capturing typical small town uh, America in the 1920s. It's an area of mixed methods research, and, and obviously, mixed methods research, you get all sorts of issues about how different methods may throw up conflicting or at least not obviously compatible uh, findings. And it throws up this issue about the relationship between researchers and research. I mentioned the trend towards um, collaborative partnership um, uh, research. And it also raises the question about you know, the purpose of research. Why are we doing this? What, what's the point of studying this community?